This is the start of a 1500 mile road trip to seven countries. We'll be going through medieval fortresses, Roman mausoleums and churches and so many different places that are UNESCO protected. Starting our seven country road trip in here in Dubrovnik, Croatia. Now, the question I had when I was looking at research on this city is that a lot of the videos and articles I have seen talk about a lot about the Game of Thrones that was filmed here. Now, if you don't know, it's a popular TV series that is known around the world. It was actually filmed here in Dubrovnik. I think there is a little concern though, because this history is so much more than Game of Thrones. And are we letting social media and this craze of, of movies and, and things overshadow the rich history that's here? That's what I want to find out. So let me take you on a tour of Dubrovnik and share not just the history, but also the social aspect. I'll have you tell me what you think impacts you more. Let's do this. I wanted to give you guys a quick tour of our apartment here right in the center of Dubrovnik. So it starts out down this little hallway and this is the bathroom. You got the little sink, a tiny airplane like spacing with the toilet. I don't know about that, but. have uh, the shower, the kitchen here, you have coffee, sugar, tea, coffee maker, and Kate and the host was so nice. They left us this beautiful bottle of 2021 wine with some candies and a little gift to help remind us of our stay here. Oh, it's like a pottery thing, magnet. There's a small TV. They do have Wi-Fi here. There's a twin bed up here. Uh, looks like a queen up here. And then this also turns into a bed as well. It does take about 20 stairs to get up to the apartment. Right down the stairs though, across the alley, you can see Minsetta Fortress. It's right next to a church. We are right in the heart of Dubrovnik. And so that's why we chose this place. So we're gonna rest up and then take you guys out on the town later after I find my luggage. I hope it makes it here in time before we have to leave to our next country. Dubrovnik hasn't always been known by this name, but for much of its history, it was named Ragusa, and the city was developed by Roman refugees. It was known for its favorable tides, southern wind, and ties to Venice, and their lucrative salt trade. Ragusa was established in the 7th century by refugees from Apodarius, a Roman city 15 kilometers south, who called it Ragusa. Okay, Aaron. What are your first impressions of Dubrovnik? It's super old and super awesome, and I want to be in a film here. <laughs> I think it stands out though. <laughs> like Game of Thrones film? I think Maybe it like, is. Isn't think... that one of those things that they filmed here? Wait, what's Game of Thrones? I've never heard of that before. Oh, shame. <laughs> shame. The Stratton, which is this long street, used to be the moat for the city. So this whole area is part of the old city and we're staying like right around this area. And here is the Stratton, which is always really busy. Located just at the end of the Stratton and a great place to meet if you have big groups is the Clock Tower. Originally adorned with two wooden men, they were designed to strike the bell but were later replaced with two bronze figures named Maro and Baro. As the years passed, though, the bronze figures became tinted green from the salt from the Adriatic. With the physical changes came the name Zelensi, which means green men. Eventually, the clock fell into disrepair, and it was repaired by the Franciscan brothers, who gave it its characteristic octopus-like hands on the clock face. The clock itself has been maintained for more than a hundred years by the same family who passes down the tradition for generations of maintaining the staple of this city. 
you can climb the clock tower. You just want to make sure you're not up in the clock tower when it chimes at noon, or you can kiss your eardrums goodbye. Be careful as you're walking through the city. The limestone that makes up Dubrovnik with all of the tourists and cruise ship visitors that come through has actually polished it to where it always looks wet. And when it does get wet, you better be hanging on to somebody or have really good traction on your shoes because it gets slick. So when you're on the strat and you want to make sure that you're going down some of these aisle, aisleways because that's where you're going to get the cheaper pricing of the restaurants as well as a little bit more of a local flavor. Because of the salt trade, Dubrovnik or Ragusa became very wealthy very quickly. In fact, in medieval times from the 14th to 17th century, Dubrovnik was a free state that came along with free thinking and innovation. The shipbuilding was so innovative that while the ships were being built, they were hidden from the public and spying from the enemies under large archways that you can still see near the Dubrovnik ports. One of my favorite things to do when I get to a new city is to just take a day and tour the town without an itinerary or plan in hand. It lands you in places like this, a farmer's market. My favorite things that I found at the market were actually these candied oranges as well as lavender, one of my favorite scents. That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. After we grabbed something to eat, we suddenly heard chanting in the streets and decided to go check it out. I think we just crashed the wedding party. <laughs> this is awesome. So right behind me here, this is just outside of Pile Gate. And if you remember, this is where Joffrey was attacked right before or right after he, he became king. And the mob came down on him and Sansa. And so one of the places in the city that if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you got to come see. This is also important to the city because this is the main entrance to the city. So the historical importance there. Also, right outside the gate, you will find this statue of St. Blaise. Again, you'll see him throughout the entire city. And, and he is the patron saint of Dubrovnik. So Dubrovnik survived an 18-month siege from the Ottomans. Not once, but twice. And you can see some of the old cannonballs here right outside of Pile Gate. If you get a little tired of the busyness of the city, you can always head up the funicular on top of Mount Surd, where there is a lovely restaurant that gives you epic views of the city and incredible sunsets. If you want to eat there though, I highly suggest getting a reservation. It was in 1979 that Dubrovnik was added to the UNESCO World Heritage Site list for its medieval architecture and fortified old town. The town was named UNESCO site due to its retained medieval walls that are still so perfectly preserved. There's nothing more European than getting gelato. The Venetians actually ruled this place for a while, but the first day in Dubrovnik with the live music, the gelato, the, I've got lavender and pistachio. Cannot wait to dig in. Oh my God. Seriously. The lavender ice cream. I've never had, it is so good. It is so good. I love lavender and it 
tastes even better. It tastes just like it smells, but with sweet. Oh. As we ate our gelato and the sun set on the city, some musicians came out and started playing one of my favorite songs, Ave Maria. The next morning we were off to split Croatia. Make sure to check out culturetrekking.com for all of the written guides to all of these videos and more. After our split tour, the next morning we woke up early again so we could get some pictures of the city where there was nobody awake and nobody there. It really is a magical moment that I highly suggest doing. So this is Orlando's column and he is a mythical knight in the medieval times that is said to have guarded the city. Right across from the clock tower, you will see the Church of St. Blaise. Now, this is the patron saint of Dubrovnik, which I will point out his statue all around the city. Now, the reason that he's the saint of Dubrovnik is because the Venetians were in the harbor and they were supposed to just be exchanging food and wine and such, but they were actually here to attack the city. Well, Mr. Blaise at the time, he found out about it and warned the city. Um, it's really interesting if you read the history of Dubrovnik and that every citizen was actually expected to be a part of the um, protection of the city. And if anyone found out that you kept a secret that would harm anyone within the town, then you would actually be punished. So St. Blaise warned of the Venetians coming in and their diabolical plan to overtake the city as a guise of exchanging food and wine and such. So when he warned it, he say, when he warned the, the officials, he actually saved the city and they never really found out where he was, but um, the, a stranger described him as a man with a capped hat and a wooden staff. So as you look around the city, you will see this image throughout Dubrovnik. This day of St. Blaise is actually celebrated on February 3rd. So if you're in town, this would be a great time to visit this church, uh, but be respectful when you go in. Do not videotape people who are there to actually worship. Because fresh water was so important to the city, they actually had two fountains. So this is considered the small Anufri's fountain and the, at the other end of the stratum, you will get the larger Anufri's fountain with the classic domed building. One of the easiest ways to conquer a city is to cut off their fresh water supply. However, the innovation and architects of Dubrovnik were able to combat that by building Anufri's fountain and cisterns. In fact, the roof of Sponsa Palace was once used as a collecting roof for the cisterns for the fresh water that supplied the city of Dubrovnik. However, after several droughts, the authorities decided in 1436 that enough was enough, and they took Onufri Giordano della Cava to oversee the construction of an aqueduct running from a well some 12 kilometers away into the center of the city. And that is how they ended up with Onufri's fountain. Rubbing the nose of the Shakespeare of Dubrovnik, Marin Drizic, is said to bring you back to this city, so make sure to do that before you leave.
So behind me here, these are the Jesuit stairs that actually is where the Walk of Shame happened with the green screen and all. So the Jesuit College is at the top of it and I will explain a little bit more about that later as well as how important it was for the education and the advancement of the people in this city. Since Dom is the only one that has not watched Game of Thrones, we're making her do the Walk of Shame. Shame! 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 Shame. So we're headed over to the Franciscan Monastery, which is part of the Dubrovnik Pass. But the Franciscan Monastery was opened in 1317 and is considered the third oldest pharmacy in the world. It also has very important documents that are date, that date from the 10th century, as well as a church inside. But it's well worth a look because an important historical part of this is that, of this monastery, is that this inside, in the garden area, there is a well that supplied fresh water to the citizens of Dubrovnik during the Yugoslavian war when they had to take shelter inside of this monastery. The oldest pharmacy in Europe was established with the monastery in 1317, just in time for the plague to start sweeping Europe. The first physician was mentioned in 1280, Magister Josephus. The plague struck Dubrovnik in 1348, with the city records estimating 2,000 to 10,000 lives lost in a matter of four years, out of a population believed to have numbered between six and 30,000. Leprosy was an issue as well up until the 16th century, and they had their own town outside the city walls and was one of the first documented instances of quarantine. Malaria was also an issue, and Dubrovnik was one of the worst areas for malaria along the Adriatic coast. When the French sailors arrived, they brought sexually transmitted diseases or maladies of the genitalia. There are four types of doctors in Dubrovnik depending on their practice and a female medical doctor was mentioned in 1325 who was likely a midwife. A law stipulated that a physician was not to be paid until the patient was healed or the desired effect achieved. The first garbage men were mentioned in 1415 along with proper drainage of the city, paving of the streets and shop owners were required to sweep and keep their storefronts clean. In 1436, aqueducts and sewage systems were installed in the city, making this one of the cleanest cities in Europe. A lot of people that come to Dubrovnik forget that there was a devastating war that happened here. If you go to the War Photo Limited Museum, you can get an idea of how much it affected the people in this region. Just be warned, some of the photos can be raw and disturbing but I think it is an important part of history that we need to remember. The Yugoslav Wars were a series of separate but interrelated ethnic conflicts, wars of independence and insurgencies that took place in the SFR Yugoslavia from 1991 to 2001. Specifically, the war here in Croatia for independence lasted from 1991 to 1995. Approximately 25% of Croatia's economy was ruined. An estimated $37 billion in damage in infrastructure, lost output and refugee costs. Over 20,000 people were killed in the war, just in Croatia.
we just got back from the War Photo Museum and I think just having a little time to regroup um, after seeing some of the things that were there or the images that were there um, was important. I definitely think it is worth going. It is very moving in a difficult way. One of the things that was on exhibit that really moved me to tears was they have this rotating um, exhibit in the center on the second floor and it, it's about the end of Yugoslavia, which is the area that we're going to be touring for the next 16 days. And this, it was a video in the center of footage that had been captured during the war. A lot of it was very graphic. Um, I am a physician assistant and I worked in the operating room for six and a half years in the trauma unit and seeing you know, some of the images that were coming through with that was really difficult. Um, the thing about war is that no one wins. And the first casualty of war is truth. And it's really important that we remember what has happened here and don't gloss over it that it only was 30 years ago. It was in the 1990s. Many of the people here um, lived through that time period. So if you come here, just make sure that you don't ask about it unless someone brings it up because this can be very triggering for them. So I definitely still recommend that you go um, if you can handle those sort of things. And yeah, now we're gonna head out to Sponsa Palace, Rector's Palace, and show you those important buildings and how they were such an integral part of the Ragusan society. And then just kind of chill, get some dinner, and get ready for the beginning of our 1500 mile road trip. So see you in a second. Sponsa Palace was built in the 16th century, and the building was intended as a storage space and a customs house. Over time, it changed its purpose so that it was also a mint armory, printing house, school, and seat of Dubrovnik trade. Today, Sponza is the seat of the state archives and a very rich collection of books and documents. It's also called Divana. The palace is now home to the city archives, which hold documents dating back to the 12th century, with the earliest manuscript being from the 10th century. This is the inscription of do not rip people off. I think so, but I can't read what it actually says, so we're just going to go with it. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments down below. <laughs> So right behind me here, this is Rector's Palace, and the Rector was kind of like the governor for Dubrovnik. Because it was ruled by lords and they all kind of took turns as being a Rector, they had to take one month out of the year to be the Rector. And in order to, you had your private chambers, this is where the offices were, this is where a lot of the hub of the activity of Dubrovnik started or was conducted. Um, this, they also had, this functioned as a prison. Um, there's a lot of manuscripts and important documents inside, but it is now the cultural museum of Dubrovnik that you can go inside. It's included in the Dubrovnik Pass. So if you want to save a little money, that's a great way to do it. Um, you have one day pass, a three day pass, or a whole week pass. Um, but when you go inside, you can learn about who the rectors were, about how the government functioned here. Sorry, a little bit of wind because it's going to rain today. But in order for the rector to leave the rector's palace, they had to actually get permission from the Senate just because it was uh, a prison. So they didn't want to leave the prisoners in there. Up here you can see different um, sketchings on the wall where the plaster used to be. So cool. This is the coat of arms of Dubrovnik. 
me. <laughs> I imagine him saying that when he's talking. like traveling chess or maybe where he oh these are safes look at these mechanisms that's so cool We quickly headed over to the Jesuit College, but unfortunately it was closed. The Jesuit Stairs, or the Baroque Staircase, is actually from 1738. Some compare the staircase to the famous Roman staircase, which leads from the Piazza de España to the Church Trinata de Monti. I was able to go into the Church of St. Ignatius. The church belfry houses the oldest bell in Dubrovnik that was cast in 1355. At the front, you'll see Baroque frescoes with scenes from the life of St. Ignatius, painted by Giantano Garcia. I think in the end, no matter if you're coming to Dubrovnik because you saw Game of Thrones or you're coming because you love the history or just the scenery, it's worth it no matter why you come to visit. But just don't forget you can be inspired by the stories, the people, and the history of a place and not just what you see in the movies. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, share it with a friend, and I'll see you in the next one where we're going on the Dubrovnik City Walls.